Tony, it's great to see you, mate. Um, I will say I've tried to leave you in peace as best as I can over the last um, few years or in your retirement because I was very conscious at the start that um, you said that that was you done with the media and all the rest of it. Um, but I've called upon you to do me a favour of, of coming <laughs> on my podcast, so I'm massively grateful that you've agreed Pleasure. to do it, mate. No problem, mate. You um, are one of very few journalists. I don't even class you as a journalist, you mean mate, so it was my personal phone number, so uh, it wasn't a problem at all. And I constantly get the abuse of, leave Tony Bellew alone, he wants to just be with his missus, he wants to disappear. Well, I disappeared for a good 12 months nearly, and, uh, and then the last 12 months I've been pretty busy, so it's, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think I'll ever be a media darling, but because uh, I've got too much to say and, and I'm very opinionated. But uh, in a nice way, it's kind of nice to, to catch up with you, mate. I think you're doing all right as a media darling, though. Like you're becoming quite, you you're becoming almost as known for your TV stuff as you were for your boxing. Thank you. I didn't I didn't think so, but uh, if it's come from you, mate, it must be half two. So thank you. Well, my missus watches SAS. She never watched any of the fights. <laughs> And, uh, and, and you've done a lot of A League of Their Own stuff, which has been next level. I've had to message you after them. The, f the first one in particular was hilarious when they took you to the top of the, um, to the, top of the building yeah. and on the scaffolding, and then they dropped you. Yeah, absolute clowns. Uh, I, could st I should absolutely kill Corden. He should be dead by now, but he's got away with it. Uh, do you know what? I've never watched it back, Tris, so I don't know. I never really watch myself back on TV because it's embarrassing and I cringe when I hear my own voice. But uh, the league of their own stuff, I've loved going on the show. It's a fantastic show. Uh, and the lads are all top lads. I get on well with Jamie Redknapp, with Fred Flintoff, uh, and, and Corden, James Corden's brilliant. He's, he's fantastic. He really is a top, top man. And I should not forget Ramesh Ranganathan. I love him. He's boss. Um, life's changed a lot for you. Uh, I recall being in the entrance to the MEN Arena with former Boxing News editor Claude Abrams, and we were there before a fight, and you were there with some other young amateurs, possibly young pros, probably young amateurs, I think, at the time. And I think you were there in your trackie going to a big fight. It might have been even a hat and it might have been a hat and night, I can't quite recall. But you were so young and you had that real thirst for boxing knowledge and you were so into it. How do you feel about boxing now? Because you had that enthusiasm then. I loved it. I loved it then, and I still love it now to a certain degree. Uh, I'm able to detach myself away from it. Now, when you first see me in them days, I've been to the MEN to watch all the guys. So I was there for Calzaghi fights. I was there for Hatton fights. I've been, I was there when Tyson appeared there. I've been there so many times, and I've been to so many different professional boxing venues. In that early time, there was nothing I didn't know about boxing. Every current boxer, every relevant boxer, even the guys who no one knew about, uh, I could tell you about their opponents, I could tell you about the style, the way they were. I just knew all these things, and it was the only thing that I could really focus and, and, and give all my attention to boxing at that time. How do I feel about it now is kind of different, because I've spent my lifetime studying it, I've spent my lifetime actually doing it. So I'm very grateful for what it's given me. It gave me a way out, that's the most important thing. It gave me family and opportunity to flourish, to, to have nice things, and to give me all the things that I dreamed of as a kid growing up. So that's what boxing's done for me, first and foremost. Secondly, uh, I'd like to feel I've given a good part of me, well, I've given the major part of my life. It, it, it took hold me life. Boxing was never a hobby. Boxing was never a job to me. Boxing was never a biz just a business. It was a way of life. I got expelled from school, uh, and when I got expelled from school, I was thinking, I had so many things that I was thinking I was going to do. Uh, some untoward things as well, but I was doing all kinds, whatever it took to make money, I was to, you know, here and there and everywhere. And then, at this stage, I was just an amateur boxer who was playing around with it, getting a couple of buses to Canny Farm and having a little play around. Uh, up and then, going to somewhere like Rotunda ABC and coming on the Jimmy Albertine, the tutelage of him, that's when I really thought, this is going to be my way out, this is what I'm going to focus on. That's when I kind of stopped doing the untoward things I was doing. Uh, I'm really focused on boxing. Like what? What sort of anti-war things? Did you get in trouble? Uh, um, or did you avoid trouble? A bit of both. So I avoided trouble. Sometimes I attracted trouble. Uh, I would fight with anyone anywhere. You I, I did the doors from a young age, Yes. Right? Uh, my first job was 
working in the 051 nightclub, which was a brilliant nightclub in town. And my job was to stand on the DJ box. I started off as a glass collector and it didn't really last long doing that. I remember someone being off the key, knocking into me one night and I was 15 and uh, give me a show or a push and I just cracked them. Obviously I could fight in box and the grown man just went out like a light. Uh, it makes you grow up so much faster than you should really grow up really. You know, you see drugs, you see nightlife, you see women, you see drink, alcohol. I'm not even 16 yet. And then I would be doing that on the weekend and I would go back to school on Monday and my mates were like, what did you do this week? And I was like, I was in the best nightclub in Liverpool. You know, we were open till four eight o'clock in the morning. We seen this one, we seen that one, the women in there. They, so it was just so young. And then as I kept going up and up, 16, 17, 18, I worked on a, a front door of a nightclub then, a place called Society. And then, as I said, that's what me, me job was doing then. Uh, were you working with your dad at the time? I was working with my dad. On yeah. the doors together? Yeah. Uh, what a pastor of the torch that is. You know what, it was nuts, mate. My dad was, my dad was always someone I looked up to and idolised as a kid. My dad was a really hard man. My dad could really fight. Uh, he was someone who, who was, you know, he, he just, he would fight anyone, anywhere. No one, you know, he was just wasn't that kind of person to cross. Was he so, fair or was he... Oh, he was, was fair. He, he was never cannon? a bully. He was not a bully. He was not a loose cannon. He was just someone who would... I was laughing and joking. So when my dad was working on the door, I'd be standing there with him. And I would always observe him and watch my dad. Uh, and I would see the biggest fellas come up to the door and everyone would want to get into the nightclub that he was that he was at. So it was the society one, the old one where we had, I think it was seal suit was around, something like that. And he would always want to get in this place because the ratio for men to women was like two to one. And so uh, as you can imagine, all the hard cases want to get in. And when they'd come up to the door, my dad would always rip them. My dad would always have a little pop of the clothes or the shears or the shoes. Fucking hell, lad, where'd you get them shoes from? You can't come in here with shoes like that. And it would always, he would determine, what would be the determining factor would always be their response to what he said. So when it'd be like, what, who the fuck are you? You know, well, my fucking clothes are sound. It'd be like, mate, it's not for you this place tonight, you know. Or, you know, I was just joking, but it's not for you on your way. But if someone come back and said, lad, the kip are your shoes. You've got that jacket on, you look a holy show. And they had a laugh and a joke with him. He would 99% of the time let them in. And it was just, his nice way was, you know, it's nice to be nice, that's how my dad was. But the minute you would see it switch and flick, when someone would challenge him or put it on him, then you would soon see it straight away. So I, I always had that in me. Uh, I think he passed that to me as uh, I got older. But... As I say, mate, I always looked up to my dad and I loved him and idolised him. But so did you guys have scraps together? I sparred with my dad uh, when I was 13, 14. Did uh, he take you to the gym? Yes, first? my dad took me to the boxing yeah. gym first. Well, he took me to a kickboxing gym first. Okay. His friend was Alfie Lewis, who was an amazing kickboxer. Probably the best kickboxer this country's ever produced. Uh, and that was his business partner in the security company and his friend and Alfie was great. So I kickboxed for a number of years as a kid and I got to an half decent level. I got to a brown and white belt. That was one belt away from black and then remember them saying, you've got to do 12 months of training to prepare for your black belt. And I was like, I've been doing gradings every three months for how many years? Can I just not do another three months and I'm going to be a black belt? And they were like, no. And I was like, like fuck this, I'm not doing that. So uh, I done that and I knocked the kid out with a punch uh, a straight shot in, in one of the fights and it happened again in the fight after so I remember Alfie saying maybe you should look at boxing because you're really good with your hands my dad was, was teaching me how to punch in the yard in the house at the time at this age I was what, nine, ten. it was just before my dad had left home uh, and from there mate I just I, I pursued boxing I'd always watch boxing so I was always watching Mike Tyson I'd stay up late, I'd always study him and I'd always watch how he fought he intrigued me and and I don't know, we always watching Mike Tyson and Nigel Bennett excited me. They fight on the edge of the seats. I love people who fight and, and that's what comes to their mind first and foremost. Eubank, I, I like them for different reasons. Because uh, he was so, everything was about the show. Everything was about his persona. I, I'm putting that across first. So I, I took little bits from everybody who I could learn. So he was the guy who everybody loved to hate. And, you, and every fighter who's going to get to a certain level has to have that. You have, to, you have to have a little bit of each of these fighters to understand it. And, I, and literally, as I'd studied all these fighters, I took little bits of every one of them. Because you accepted the role as being the hated guy at some point in your career, didn't you, later on? Of course, with that, I knew it was coming. Uh, and I knew 
if they loved me or they hated me, it didn't really matter as long as they wanted to see me. If you had an opinion of me, that meant I'd stay in your mind. I was doing it in the amateurs, I was doing it in the pros. I mean, I won one of my amateur fights in a place called the Montrose, and, and whoever was there that night will probably tell you and they remember it. I stopped a kid from John Lyon's old place, Wigan, ABC, I think it was, uh, and I stopped him, I think his name was Cunliffe, I stopped him in the second or third round with a left hook to the body, a body shot had done him. And I remember just walking over to his corner, standing on the ropes and saying, I am the best you lot will ever see in here. I made the people on the bill, with Declan O'Rourke was on the bill at under ABC. Yeah, I remember him boxing with black and gold shit with stars up his shorts. Certain things stick in my mind. Uh, that was the second time I ever came across Jimmy Albertina. And I remember going, I am the man, I am the... And I was on... And amateur boxers don't do that. How old were you? At that age, I was then 16, 17. Okay. Because I was speaking to Chris Walker yesterday, yeah, um, doing some homework, and he was he was talking about how you came from nowhere as a senior, and there was a there was a tournament, a couple of tournaments, but a period of time really where you really started to get your legs underneath you and start to think that possibly this could be a career, mm. and it was when it was in that when you won your first senior, you fought Mick Carroll, Sam Sexton yeah. in a war which people still say is one of the best amateur fights I've ever seen. Yeah, it was definitely the hardest amateur fight in my whole career, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, that was a really, really hard night, and I went to work on the door after that, and I knew it must have been bad because my dad said, go home. I, I'd fought Sam Sexton, and it was an absolute trench. So, I'd He was sparring Herbie Hyde at the time as well, well wasn't he? I think. So the worst thing about... I'd gone in the, in the novice ABAs, under 10s and under 20s, back-to-back, -back, at light heavyweight 81 kilos. I was getting ready for the full ABAs and there was three of us going to go in at the same weight. Paul Keir, Mick Whitty and me. So we were all going to go in at 81 and Mick Whitty, I'll tell you what, you two go in at 81 because there was Joe Ains going in the area as well and we knew there was going to be a good few box-offs to get where we was going to get. And he said, well, what about if I go to 91 and you two do, do 81? So we kind of had an agreement because none of us thought we were big enough for 91. So... It got to a week to go before the weigh-in, and Mick Whitty come in the gym and he went, I'm 86 kilo and I cannot get any heavier. I've ate and ate and <laughs> ate and ate. I can't get any heavier. And uh, Mick McAllister and John Doolan were in the room. Me, Paul Keir and Mick Whitty are standing there, and I went, I'll do it. And Mick, and Mick went, what do you mean? He said, you're 83 kilos today. I said, I promise you now I'll do it, and I'll turn up on Monday at the gym and I'll be 91 kilos. And he went, don't be ridiculous. I said, trust me, I'm, I, I want to fight at this weight. All as I could think of was, I'm going to be able to eat what I want, because I was dying like a lunatic at this time uh, to make 81. And I was saying to them, trust me, I'll do it. I turned up at the gym on the Monday, and I was 91 and a half kilos. Don't get me wrong, I'd had Sayers, McDonald's, cooked breakfast, I'd had the whole lot, me biscuits, milkshakes, everything. And... Mick Whitty and Paul Keir, I'm not sure that they box each other. I think one of them boxed Joe Ainsco and the other one uh, got a bye or whatever have you, and I think Joe Ainsco beat him. So, anyway, first fight I get drawn against a big fella called Mick Carroll, and uh, he was big, he was a big, fully-fledged 91-kilo boy, and I always remember Nick Pete thinking that he that he beat me in, in the fight, and he always we always laugh and joke about it, because Nick Pete's followed me my whole career. He's my friend, he's a really good friend of mine, a good lad. And uh, he thought McCaddle beat me on the night, and I knew I'd, I'd outbox McCaddle. One thing that everybody anticipated was everybody labelled me just as a puncher after the ABAs, after my novice titles, because my first no under 10 novice final, I knocked the guy stone cold in six seconds. I knocked him completely out. He was asleep the minute the left hook landed. In the second ABA final, uh, I knocked him out in the first round. So, you know, and people were looking at me career going forward. I think in me, I'd had. I'd won under 10s and under 20 novices with 13, no, 11 bouts. My 11th bout, I think it was, because I won the ABAs in my 16th bout. Yeah. So I had four fights. So my first fight in the heavy at 91 kilos was my 12th fight, and that was against Mick Carroll from the Kirkdale. The Tunder and Kirkdale have got a bit of a rivalry. I mean, the Tunder ABC is the greatest club in the country. There's just no two ways about it. We produced the most national champions. We were brilliant. Jimmy Albertina was the greatest coach this country's ever seen. So, I represented Rotunda, Mikhail represented the kick there. I went out to beat him on points, and it was the first fight I'd had in a long time that went to points. I beat him over four twos. Second fight in, 
I always remember Stephen Smith saying this lad's really good. Stephen Smith must have knew Sam Sexton from England duty being in right. Crystal Palace and stuff like that. And uh, and the way that in the camp was, he, he, you know, he's very experienced, he's very good. He'd had over 50, 60 fights. This was going to be my 13th, 13th bout. And it was, I got in the ring in Everton Park Sports Centre and we just went at it straight away. And he met me, stood in the middle of the ring and he, he knocked 10 bells out of me and I knocked 10 bells out of him. One round goes past, two round goes past. And I kept being one down, one down. And then at the end of the third round, I remember them saying, you're five down in the corner. Now, I didn't know whether they were saying that to me because to rival me up and get me going or whether that was really the case. I still don't know to this day. I went out for round four. I remember avoiding one of his jab, boom, right hand hits him and then a left hook follows it and he, boom, he goes down on one knee and he takes a knee. And as the referee's counting, he, he done the cleverest thing I've still ever seen any amateur boxer do because amateur boxers don't usually have the the capacity to go right. I mean, he, he got his, he put his glove into the strap under his chin. I think he wore like one of them head guards and he snapped the strap with his glove. And I remember screaming, you fucking cheat. He got to throw him out, you can't do that. Cause he was, I knew if I'd have got him after this left hook and landed, I was only going to jump on him and stop him. He must've got two or three minute rest. And I, I, I was furious, I couldn't believe it. And then we went a couple of minutes rest he got and then I jumped on him again. And I say, me, me face was covered in blood. Is he wore blue and white? I think the colours he wore, or he wore definitely a light colour. And I remember his vest was covered in my blood because he, his nose weren't bleeding. Uh, we finished the fight. My both hands were bruised and swollen really bad. I didn't break them, but they were swollen, uh, really sore. I'm finishing the fight and going back to the dressing room. I won by five. So I must have scored set whatever anyway. Have you seen him since to talk about the strap? Yeah, uh, we've we've seen each other when we've been pros. I always looked out for him and stuff like that because I knew he was going to be a good decent decent pro. Yeah. He's a really strong boy. Uh, I think he still definitely think he was a cruiserweight. Don't think he was a heavyweight, but and what a brilliant fighter, you know. And that fight that that's when I started to realise that right, I've beaten England international, who's had five six times more fights than I have. I am quite good at this. So what that did David Dolan teach you? That was the first time I couldn't understand how someone could beat me who I had technically had more ability than. And what it made me realise is this guy can beat me because his style was suited to the amateur game. So when it came to variation of punches and power I knew where to the harder, I was much better than David Dolan. My variation of punch, I would go to body, I would switch it up with uppercuts, I would do all kinds of different things. I could switch to southpaw. But David Dolan had a style that would just... I couldn't deal with, I couldn't beat it. If you got David Dolan in a professional ring with me, I'd have annihilated him in a couple of rounds, but he could just jab and punch me face off over four twos. He had so much experience of just took up, land your shots, move, and I just couldn't beat it. Uh, so that learning to deal with that, it only, it's only when you come away from it and you, you go professional, you go, that's why he could beat me, because he just had the, the brains to just cover up, tap, tap, tap. Covered up, tap, tap, tap. I didn't get into boxing for that. I, I got into boxing because I wanted to hear people. I wanted to take their head off. I wanted to knock them out. I was always going to be on the losing end in, a, in an amateur game with a professional style because my, my plan was never to win on points. My plan was to render you unconscious. And back then, the judges didn't appreciate a professional style either, did they? No. They, they preferred the amateur style. I went to the body and, and never, <clears> ever scored a point. I remember fighting Danny Price in an ABA final and I must have landed 25 body shots and he didn't score one. But as I say, you look back on things and you just think, well, everything for a reason. You mentioned that power and the reputation that you had already by then, but when you knocked out John Lewis Dickinson cold on BBC, your reputation grew exponentially, didn't it? Yeah. When I knocked him out, and it wasn't just any knockout, I mean, I, I rendered him unconscious for a, for a while. It's on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, it was a nasty one. And another great lad as well, by the way. Uh, but it was the first time I'd seen someone rendered unconscious in an ABA final. I'd never seen that before in an ABA final. I'd seen people stopped on the feet, usually, or the referee jump in and give them standing counts, but I'd never seen anyone get hit and just remain asleep on the floor for quite a while. People started picking up then, wow, this lad can really punch. And I think... If anything, that then, that then harmed my actual international England career. 
Well, because every, everyone judged you off that. And any, anything less than that was a disappointment then, wasn't it? It, it wasn't for me, but it was for the people yeah, sure. who, who followed me and supported me because John Lewis Dickinson was the massive favourite going as everyone thought he was going to box the head off me. He'd beaten good, really good people. Uh, and he was someone whose style was supposed to cause me all kinds of problems. And don't get me wrong, it was causing me all kinds of problems. I can't remember how many points I was down, but I was down by quite a few when I landed that left hook on his head. But then, as I said to you before, I was never getting into these amateur fights to score points. I was getting in to put you to sleep, and it was just that simple. And as I said, I think that done me more harm because when I go on England camps and stuff, I just couldn't prepare to them stars. And also, I didn't agree with certain people coaching me and stuff like that. So, the best thing about when I went to the GB setup, it was different. You'd be different coaches. It wasn't just one. So when I first joined the England camp, it was Terry Edwards. He was the boss and that was it. Dave Pocknell was his assistant and other coaches will get brought in now and again. When we got to the GB setup, much more proper boxing coaches came in. And that's no disrespect to Eddie or Dave Pocknell was a brilliant coach. Eddie was a good coach. At, uh, Terry was a good coach at what he taught to a certain extent. But I, sh I shouldn't say this, but I am going to say it helps so much more when the actual person has took the punches yeah. unless they've been to an absolute level of the likes of Emmanuel Stewart, Eddie Futch. They're different calibers of people because they've lived it their whole lives. You can't go from being a taxi driver to telling an elite athlete, an elite level, world-class boxer, what he should and shouldn't be doing. I just don't believe you can do that. You can't go from being a taxi driver to doing that overnight. And in certain inst instances, that was done. When the likes of Richie Woodall came in, I was so excited by it, but Richie just didn't get the chance to really coach us properly, which was a say, shame. Did you think of sticking around for Beijing 2008? Was that on your... Because th you're mates with all those guys, with Chunky. Yeah, all yeah. All Chunk was one of my good mates on the camp. Uh, there was Stephen Smith, Chunky, Frankie, David Pricey, Price, yeah, yeah. Pejo, all lads. I still stay in touch and speak to some of them through social media and stuff. Uh, my dream was never the Olympics. I knew I was never good enough to win the Olympic medal. My goal was always the 2000, was it the six Commonwealth Games? Commonwealth. Them Commonwealth Games were my platform that I wanted to go to because I knew that was the easiest tournament that carried the most coverage. So I knew I could have made a big name for myself there and got a great deal on the back of it. That was always my goal. And when I didn't go there, I was so disappointed. It just finished me as an amateur boxer. I had no, everything in amateur boxing didn't matter to me anymore after I got bombed for that. I just, I thought, ah, forget this. And then I was, that's when, I started doing other bits and bobs, thinking it's only my time for to go professional, and then I don't know where mate Rachel got fucking pregnant. So, just going back a little bit, Chris Walker, by the way, said that you always wore outlandish clothes at school. <laughs> I knew, <laughs> what was that? I knew what that were you wearing? Mention me, uh, mate. I, I I liked loud things then. Like yeah. what? Go on. I would wear bright tracksuits, mate. Were you the Fresh Prince of? Uh, uh, the Fresh Prince of Waver Tree. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, the TV show, that. mate. I had. <laughs> Two diamonds in my ear, and this year I had a big chain with a big cross. I mean, I've got a cross tattooed on my arm. I don't even believe in anything. Uh, I, the cross that I have tattooed on my arm is more to remember of the people who have lost rather than people uh, who I haven't. Uh, what, believe in the big God situation. All that. I don't knock anyone who does, by the way, but each to your own. But for me, it just... I've seen too many, too much shit go on that that makes me believe. But yes, I was bright and out there in the day. So the big chain on the cross on it. Have you kept any of that stuff? No, I, I bought myself a proper chain, but that's that, that's another story here because I always wanted one. But yeah, I, I was, I was out there, and as I said to you, I was carrying a persona where I had to show people I'm going to make it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So I was always telling people, mark my word, when I would tell them. And Walker, I could tell you, because Walker's been around me for the best part of 28, 29 years. He's known me for. He's known me since we were 11. So what? I'm 26 years he's known me for. Uh, and I've always been the same. I've never changed. And I've always been going, on. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And, and thankfully, it's all worked out in the end. But when, when you're telling people you're going to do this and that, and you're in a big, bright... Uh, Everlast tracksuit box with boxing gloves on the chair and people always think he's nuts this fella he's around the bend and I did sound nuts for a long time you know I was telling people I'm going to have a fight at Goodison Park there'd never been a fight at Goodison Park it just it never happened so when these things finally did happen it's like oh he finally got there in the end didn't he he did actually do it so can I ask a question when you were doing the nightclubs and doing the doors and stuff and you talk about being surrounded with um, drugs, drinks, women and all that 
Did you go from that point to living the life? Or were you always no. involved in... No, in, I never uh, lived a life. Did I you? Didn't, no, I didn't live the life. I, so once a month, I would have a night off and go out with my mates. I've never took drugs, by the way. I've never took a drug, and I'm not say that. I would drink, uh, and after four drinks, mate, I would be in a state, but it would just be... I was Everything, I was always in competition. So my best mate was a professional footballer. Uh, my other friends were always ambitious and always doing other things. Uh, and I was always pushing and driving myself on to, to get better. But even on a night out when it came to drink, we'd be in competition. Who can drink the most? Who can drink the fastest? I always had the same things and I was always driving towards things that was to be a world champion boxer. Every job I had, every job I had was to subsidise the dream of one day becoming a world champion. Just on a tangent, one of the fighters we haven't mentioned that you had a lot of respect for was Rillet Bow. Yes, I loved him. Why is that? Because he was long and... He was, he was just someone who was big chunky like me, uh, but I had, a, I had a willingness and a love for fighting on the inside, and then also love to raid the fridge. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie, so, and, he, and he just, the way he carried himself, I just idolised him. You turn pro at light heavy, should you have been a career cruiser? I get asked that question quite a bit. Do you? Should I have or should I not? I don't know, what, what I will say is, if, if I had a team professional at cruiserweight, I'd have been in a lot more damaging fights. I do think that. You would have? Yeah, been in a lot more damaging okay. fights without doubt. I'd have been in a lot more harder scraps in, in the domestic scene, sorry. Uh, but then I also think I'd have provided a lot more explosive knockouts. The reason I went light heavy is because I was 26 or 27 when I turned professional, whatever it was. Uh, and my body was still not fully developed. And I knew I could get down to light heavyweight as long as I lived the life and a strict regime. Don't get me wrong, it was ridiculous when I looked at the regime I was living. But for a certain period of time, I could make it. Until I got to 30, that was when it became impossible to make light heavyweight. Once I got to 29, 30, it was just too hard. Just. Um, you turned pro, you were with um, Arnie Farnell. And for a while, it was a, it was a busy stable with Frankie Gavin, Paul Butler, they all Heffron, jumped on with me, yeah. Anthony Crawler. Brilliant um, lads, all lovely lads. As I say, I didn't have that gym mentor. I used to turn up and train basically on my own most times. Uh, it was a, it was a strange one with Farnell. I got asked, I actually spoke to Matthew Macklin. He was one of the first people I spoke to. And I said, Mac, because I, I was thinking about going with Billy Graham. Billy Graham was coming towards the very end. And I'd spoke to Billy and Billy was like, I'm, I'm coming towards the end zone, I'm done. And I'd always stay in touch with Billy. But Billy, I'd spoken to Billy on and off over the phone. Remember Paul Smith taking me up to... Phoenix come for the first time uh, and we got chatting uh, and he was amazed at my boxing knowledge, Billy Graham, because we would just sit in his Lovely, office yeah. for hours, well, for ages, just chatting and talking about different fighters. And I, would, I remember saying to him about Ricky, I said, you don't want to let him near Zab Judah. That's a terrible, and he was like, how do you know who Zab Judah is? And I was like, trust me, I'm not. And we would just go back and forth, back and forth talking. He watched me hit a bag and he said, you've got ability. Just off watching me punch a bag, he said, if the things you do, you don't understand. I would, I would be leaning on a bag on the inside, or, and I, said, I was just an amateur, and I'd be whacking it to the body, touching it with uppercut, slip and slide and rolling. And he said, just the things I know you've got a bit of class and skill about you. So I always looked at Billy as, <clears throat> as thinking I was going to turn professional with him, but it didn't work out. Uh, and then I was thinking, would I come up here and train with Georgie Vaughan and Danny Vaughan? And I don't know, I wanted to get away from the pool. That was the most important thing. I couldn't be part of the Liverpool scene. Uh, and, and certain individuals I don't think would have wanted me to be, uh, as I'd learned as time went on. Uh, so I thought, I'll give Farnells a go, see how it goes. I went up to Farnells, and to be honest, I loved his style of training. At first, we trained like the Floyd Mayweather kind of style. It was tip-tap, bang-bang, all the funny stuff for the pads, the show. I would, I would, we would do combinations on the pads, and I would bring my mates up all the time to watch me train. And I would be doing pads and, and, and I wouldn't even have to look sometimes. It would just call the combinations and I wouldn't have to look at the pads. I would hit them and nail them. Back then, at that time, were you going to be a world champion in your mind? I, I, was that the goal? In my, in my mind, I was a world champion already. That's how confident I was. Uh, and because I, of your power? Because of my power, power. Light every, because of my size advantage. You've got to remember, I weighed up every single option. I was looking at the world champions after two professional fights. I was looking at the British champion after two fights. So Dean Francis was the boy who was probably looked at as the best light heavyweight in Britain. I was adamant I would beat him after four fights. I would, I would smoke him. I was just trying. Then Dean Francis had to go, then Tony Oki was the champion. 
I was going to do him. I was going to do him. Straight away, just get me Tony Ogie. And I would tell Frank all the time. Uh, and I, I'd say that's the confidence I had in my own ability. Because I knew <clears throat> at this stage, no one's going to avoid me for 12 threes. I'm going to copy it at some point. I was so in love with my power, I, w I could have knocked anybody out. So you fought Jamie Ambler in your debut on the Carn Lawton Bill in yeah, Nottingham. Nottingham. Second fight is significant. Do you know where I'm going with this? Go on. Because it was in the Millennium Stadium for Calzaghe Kessler. I don't know where you're going, yeah. You do Go know on. where I'm going. <laughs> and it was the first time, am I right, in thinking that you'd ever set eyes on this guy called Nathan Cleverley? Yes, I came across him for the first time. I fought Adam Wilcox, an unbeaten guy. Uh, I think he was... 2-0 and or 1-0, and whatever it was, uh, <clears throat> and he, he come out flying at me. But I come across cleverly in the back when we were getting our medicals done as the boxers, and he said, oh, all right, Tony, we shook hands, and he said, how are you? All right, I'm sound, I know all about you, this and that. He was a super middleweight, I was a light heavyweight, never even crossed my mind. Um, you did meet plenty of good men on the way up, so AAT uh, Powers, Hastings Rosani, Big Matthew Ellis, who you probably knew from watching TV back in the day from his old black bond, and white suit number. Yeah, yeah. The bond, the bond outfit that he come out with. So as I was going through these guys, the Matthew Ellis one is strange because that I actually, that was in Ireland. The fight fell through. My opponent fell through because he failed a medical the day before, or the day before the weigh-in, or the day of the weigh-in. So I said to Dean Powell, I'll put weight on. Dean Powell's watching, I said, I said, do me a favour. And now this was my, I made this match because I said, Dean Powell, I'll tell you what, I'll fight Matthew Ellis. And Dean Powell said, what are you talking about? I said, just phone Matthew Ellis, offer him the fight. <clears throat> and he said, Tony's a heavyweight. And I said, I will weigh what a heavyweight weighs tomorrow. Trust me, just, I'll do it. Hold my beer. I, yeah. <laughs> I was 12 and a half stone on the Friday, the weigh-in day in, in Ireland. I think for some, it was Martin Rogan against, was it? I don't think it was Matt Skelton. No, it wasn't Matt Skelton. It was Martin Rogan against someone. It wasn't Sexton, was it? Sexton. Was, this, was there a rematch with Sexton? Yeah, I think it was. was yeah. In the Odyssey Arena? Yeah. I think it was, yes, it was. It was Sexton. I don't know how that's come back to me. So, anyway, he gets Matthew Ellis on the phone. Matthew Ellis takes it. He said, you've got to weigh in tomorrow on the day of the fight. I'd never weighed in the day of the fight before. I weighed in at 13 stone 9. And I was 12, 7 on the Friday. So I had that house and home. Uh, and <clears throat> Matthew Ellis weighed in a 14 and a half stone, but they said he was something else, but he wasn't. He was 14 and a half stone, and that was absolutely... He might have... No, was he 15 and a half stone, I think he was? Anyway, the weight discrepancy was insane, but they said he was something he weren't. Absolute at the bollocks. But I was happy. I got in the ring, and I remember just being very wary of him for the first few rounds. It's the first time I'd ever got in the ring with someone. I'm not sure what it was at this stage. This was my first eight-rounder, and I think I was six or seven, or no, something like that. And this is the first time I thought, I've got to be wary of this fella. I remember him hitting me with like a left hook on the top of the end, thinking, better be fucking careful because he's got such a weight advantage. I just started touching him down the stairs. And that's what I've done with a left hook to the body. Ne I never get much credit for being a decent body puncher, but I would always absorb and, and do well down the stairs with fighters. So I got rid of him. <clears throat> and then he started, like Frank wanted to match me quick, but he didn't want to overmatch. He, he was he, Frank was really good with how he, how he brought his fighters through to be fair sure. to him but Dean made the matches I remember him making a match once at the Echo Arena against a guy called Jindrich Vilecki yeah. and Jindrich Vilecki had something like 26 fights and he'd won he won two thirds of them and nearly all of his wins had come by knockout I remember I remember this to the I'm sitting at this press conference I can't remember who was top of the bill I'm sitting two seats away from Frank and we're talking and I remember the reporter at the time going you do know Jinder Chilek is a very dangerous opponent for Tony Bell, you don't you? And I went, doesn't matter, lad. I went, he's got more knockouts than I've got fights. And I remember Frank going, and looking at me and going, I said, say, what do you mean he's got more? Why is he... F and he, he didn't know anything about Jinder Chilek. He just Dean made the fight. Me, Dean and Frank went in the back after. And Frank went, fucking hell, you shouting bollock, Dean. And, and Dean went to Frank, he, don't worry, Frank, he shot a bit. He fucking wasn't shot a bit. He couldn't half punch as well. <laughs> But, you know, matchmakers say them things all the time. That's Eddie Ian's favourite word. He's fucking shot to bits when you're <laughs> making a match. So I said, don't worry, I'll deal with him in a couple of rounds at the most. I'll get him. And I knew just had to jump on him. My size and my intimidating frame. I remember walking to the centre of the ring and standing over him and just looking at him as if to say, you've had it. I, I would intimidate people. I would use my size and my frame. Although I look skinny and thin, my eyes would never light. They were always dark. 
when I was making weight, my eyes would always be dark, and I would just look them in the eye, and mate, it's like looking into the eyes of a monster, and I would just, I would take it out on them. I read the uh, Boxing News report of your fight with Bob Adjusafe. Yeah. Safe to say I wasn't very kind in that report. Um, it, it was, you know, it was, was a scrappy honest. fight, yeah. It was, it was a terrible was, fight. It was a scrappy fight, and he was the first guy to drop you. Yep, and, and I remember watching it back and lying to myself. Fighters are the best liars. They lie to themselves all the time. I remember it was a balance issue. It was a balance issue. It wasn't a balance issue. That was the first sign of my punch resistance. Now, when I got dropped by a journeyman called Jeff Angus Andrejevs in, in Everton Park, that was a balance issue. But when Bob Adjusy hit me, that was the first time in my life I'd ever been properly put on my back. He hit me so hard that my legs collapsed underneath me and I rolled over. And that's what, it was very similar to the Macabre knockdown. He caught me straight down the pipe, on the chin, and just, it'd be just legs just collapsing underneath me and I rolled over backwards. Uh, and he was awkward as well. He was, was, was a nightmare, yeah. mate. He was a real nightmare. But I was so vulnerable every time I made light every week. I well, was that, so, so vulnerable. That feeds into the next fight, which was the Oval McKenzie one. Yeah, that's where my eyes got open. So I, I kind of... Eyes and then you got shut. Yeah, they did. <laughs> you know what? With with the Adjusay fight, that was it. That was the warning shot to me. But I didn't take it serious because I thought I beat him anyway and I was still strong for the 12 rounds. One thing about me, when I was saying in Manchester, I was super fit. I was always really, really fit. I used to jump that bar religiously and I would get I would get the same scores as the, the lightweight like Crawler and stuff and Belly would get on that bar. I would jump the same amount of bar the same amount of times. So I, me and Jordan's levels were brilliant and then I would come home after training in Manchester and I would train again at Finch Farm with Dave Billows and Dave Billows had me fitness levels unbelievable. To me sprints, me running, me sleigh running with the sleigh on me back. Everything was done to perfection. Yeah. My boxing ability might have dropped an awful lot while, while I was in Manchester because I just fell in love with my power and I was boxing as if I was Floyd Mayweather. Mate, I'm six foot three and you're boxing like you're Floyd Mayweather like everywhere. It's insane. But that's as much my fault as it is Farnell's. So you learn and you move on. The, the change came in the McKenzie fight. I knew then. I can't keep doing this. You've got to change. I, I've got to change. Because I, what I said to myself is, my career will not last as long as I want it to if I carry on, if I stay here. And I remember, I remember going up and I was, I've, every, every time I've been changed, trained and moved, I've gone up, I've sat down with the coach and I've gave them an ultimatum. And I've said, so I remember driving up to Manchester and I said, come up, you know, the fight that happened with Mackenzie, I left it for a week and I drove up and said, oh, I need to speak to you. And he went, I'll come up and do a little session and we'll have a chat. And I went, no, we need to just talk. I went up. And I got there early before everyone else, and we sat down. And I said to Rani, "I need to bring someone in to help." And he went, what do you mean? Like, and I said, "We need help. We can't do. It. You're inexperienced. I'm a young professional. I've only got one shot at this. Let me bring someone in to help." And straight away he went, "No, I can't have someone undermine me." And trainers are very, uh, they're, they're very childish to be honest. They're very protective of their space, and they're very, I don't know that. What's the word I'm looking for? Well, the tradition is in boxing that there's only really one voice, isn't there? Yeah. And so there's a lot of people that want that. Extra. That, yeah, whether, or whether it's control yeah. over something. They want to think that they're bringing everything to the table. They're very paranoid and they're very, they're, they're just, they think that you're going to, it's about leaving and stuff like that. And I said to Arnie, I remember saying to him, Arnie, we just need an extra person to come in, an extra set of eyes. And he's like, no, can't have no one undermining me. And I was like, well, what do you want me to do? So you, you just, I'm, I'm the best trainer in the world. I know I'm the best for you. We're going to do the best. We'll do this. And I was like, oh, I can't. We shook hands and I went, we went our separate ways. <clears throat> when I left that gym, we shook hands and I was gutted as well because I'd been with Arnie for two years and we got to know each other. Uh, his family was lovely. His missus was lovely. His little boy, Frankie, was great. But you just get to a stage where we were training, doing the same things day in, day out and they weren't working. I, I, I'd forgot about my jab, completely forgot about it, and my left hand was just left by my knee. And it, all it took was a coach to go, just keep your left hand up more. When Every time you're getting close, tie up, lock up, do this, do that. So I came home to Liverpool, and I went back to Rotunda, and, and got back with Mick McAllister and Mark Quinn coming. So I had two coaches now, and that was the most important thing I'd done in my career at that point. It was, it was imperative that I went back it really, really was. It was a massive part of me, it was, because getting through that first McKenzie fight, <clears throat> the only reason I got through it was my levels of fitness were so high. 
It was, was it before the second McKenzie fight that you nearly fought cleverly? Or was it after the second McKenzie fight? Do you remember? It was after the second McKenzie Was no. it? It was no, it was, it was. It was in between after the first one. Yeah, it was in between the first and second. So let, let's just touch upon that. Um, so you were um, you tried to save to save the show. Yes, well, the so show was still going on, but um, James DeGale was fighting George Groves, and Clev was due to fight Jurgen Bremer. Correct. Bremer came out. Yeah. You wanted the spot. You were desperate to get the spot. I think we were texting every hour, and you were texting, and you were coming down on the train saying, "I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it." You didn't make it. Yeah. You tried. Oh, me. You wanted that fight. I lost 16 pounds in 16 hours. I just went to hell and back. Uh, I'd come down on the chain from Lime Street and I, I ran on the chain with a sweatsuit on, up and down the chain, up and down the chain. That's when you were texting me. You were yeah. saying, I'm on, I'm on the train doing sweatsuit, it. Sweatsuit, so it was crazy. Uh, Frank was saying, no, you shouldn't do it. I need a build up for this fight. This fight's going to be amazing when it finally happens. This, that, and this. And I was like, I'm going to fight him. I'm going to fight him. I knew I could, and you know, in my mind, I'll, I'll knock him out, I'll get him. Within three or four rounds, I'll do him because he comes to fight. Uh, I remember getting to that 0 2 in the goal, stepping on the scales and being 12 12, or was it 13 1? No, 13 1, and I'd lost 16 pounds already, and uh, I couldn't get no more off. I, I went into this after that press conference. This I, is the you fucking rap press yeah, conference. Well, I, everyone always says you fucking rap, but you don't, no one ever remembers what he said to me to get me to call him that. No, they don't. No, no one what, ever what? takes it into consideration. <laughs> the words that he said was, I'll take you in the car park right now and I'll show you who can fight. And then that's when I jump up and say, let's go now, you fucking rat. And it just stuck forever, mate, it really did. So that press conference happened, the madness happened. I left the press conference and went straight to the sauna. I got in the sauna for two and a half hours with my coach. Uh, and Mark lost nine pound. In the in the sauna, I lost no point five pound. And that was that. And that was that. I just couldn't do anything. How else. disappointed were you that you couldn't fight? Because obviously you were in a depleted state, though. So you, I was in a depleted state. Do you feel like you dodged a bullet with hindsight? Yeah. I always think if I would have made weight, that would have been the fight that I probably would have chinned him because he'd have just come straight out and had a fight with me. It was only when I fought him later on did he actually box me, and then the first fight was so good that. The rematch was never going to live up to that in the first off, and I was so much stronger in the rematch. But the first fight was just a lot of it was fought on emotion, and I was dead, dead after nine rounds. But he just didn't have the punch to stop me, you know. Uh, I've never been, no, I've never made been one for excuses. I still think I won that fight to this day. It'll always stick with me. I was ahead. You outpointed McKenzie, then you fought cleverly. You lost in Liverpool. You still think you you won, oh, 100%. but it was what he said afterwards that really grated That's what on you. Pissed wasn't it? me off. Can <laughs> see you switch now. Mate. See your eyes widen at that. Okay, now it still winds because we had an embrace after the fight in the ring. Respectful. It, yeah, yeah, and we shook hands. I hugged him and I said, "Well done." I said, "I think I've won." And he said, "I think I've won." He said, "But it's, I said it's close. This could go either way. It's one of them, but I think I've done enough." And I thought, "I'm the own fighter here. I'm definitely getting this." Every fighter who fights at home, they get them close ones. I'm the only bastard who fights in Liverpool. And when it's close, I don't fucking get it. Or they give me a draw. So, it goes, he gets his hand raised. And to me, it was dead and buried. And I, I gave him all the respect in the world. I said, well done to him. He's a brilliant fighter. He's this, this and this. It wasn't straight away that the nasty reaction came from me. I can't remember when I came out publicly and gave the bad reaction, but... One of my mates phoned me said, have you seen his post-fight press conference? And I was like, no, what are you on about? And I was like, hey, fuck him, don't worry about it. In the end, I did watch it. And I, I, it infuriated me. We just both, I was pissing blood for a week after that fight. A solid week. And his word to me in the ring was, that's the hardest fight I've ever had. You're a brilliant fighter. You know, what a fight, this and that. As I say, I've never been pushed like that in my life. And I was, you know, I was very grateful back and whatever have you said that. And that was it for me. But then he goes into a post-fight press conference and said... It was easy. He could, he can't punch. I didn't have to get out of first gear. I beat him with a cracked rib as well. Did he bollocks have a cracked rib? Because I hit that body so many times. Uh, just little things like that, and and that pushed me over the edge. I'll never forgive that. Because what you say to the media, you should be able to say to someone's face. I've never said something to the media, and I won't repeat it to his face. It's just the way. That's the way the code I've lived by all my life. So he damaged that. <clears throat> we tried to repair it after the rematch, and uh, I said I, I said to me friend who was with me at the time. I said, Gat, go, and, go and ask him to come in the dressing room and everyone get out of the dressing room. It's just going to be me and him in the dressing room. Because I'd said some really horrible things to him. 
in the at, at the weigh-in before the fight again in his mind things that are personal things that I'll never repeat to anyone but personal things that I knew about him personal things that I knew about certain members of his family I repeated it to him to get in his mind and uh, and I asked him to come in the dressing room after the fight and he agreed to it and he said yeah okay and I was going to empty out the dressing room and we could have had another fight in the dressing room after the fucking rematch because there would have been things we got off our chest but one thing that I guaranteed is We'd have left that room at the end of it and shook hands and it would have been done done for. We probably would have got on to a certain degree. But his response to come back was, eh, I've got to come in with my girlfriend. Oh, like, are you fucking messing? I said, this is no place for your girlfriend to be if something kicks off here between us. We're going to end this shite that we've had between us and that'd be it. He, wouldn't, he refused to come in with us, his girlfriend. So I told him to sling his up and fuck off and man up. And then that was the end of him. I've never spoke to him or seen him since. So, something I'll never forgive what he did after that first fight. But I was willing to put it to bed and be a proper man about it. And he just didn't want to entertain it. Um, you came back from that first Cleverly fight with a, a hard fight against former European champ Danny McIntosh. Yeah. On paper, a hard fight. My career was on the line for the first time in my life. That's what I, that's what I thought about it in that fight. Uh, Frank advised me not to do it. So, at this moment now, my relationship became strained with Frank at this point. Yeah. Really bad. As I said before, my career was on the line now. Yeah. Uh, because if I lose to Danny McIntosh after everyone thinks cleverly, well, after the media have said cleverly's beaten me, then I'm finished. Mm. And he's a former European champion, can punch, he's in the Ingle stable. Everyone has seen the problems I had with, with Bob Adger safe. I'm telling you, my ass was going walking in that night. You know, I'm never I'm never a nervous person. Don't get me wrong, when I walked out to the ring, the nerves were dead. I knew I was gonna do them. But in the build up, it kept playing on my mind. If I lose this, my career's over. And people have not no idea how much stress and pressure that puts you under when that's in the back of your mind. That's why I spoke about, when I speak now for Sky Sports and stuff, and I said about Joshua going into that Andy Ruiz rematch, I knew how he felt. Mm. Because believe you me, when your career's, for the first time in his life, his career was actually on the line. And that's what mine was against Danny McIntosh in that first fight. Luckily and good enough for me, I put in a hell of a display. That right hand over the top, mate, would have put a horse out. So... And then came, so you moved to, to Matchroom, then came Edison Miranda. Um, was that a fresh start for you? No. Did you look at things a different way? No, it wasn't a fresh start because the court battle was still going on with Frank okay. when I fought Edison Miranda. So that was all that was on my mind because you've got to remember if Frank wins the court battle, I retire. What did you make of Miranda? Edison Miranda was brilliant at what he does. He's very strong, very powerful, but make no mistake, I went in there and treated him with respect and looked at, I was going to punish him later on in the fight. I knew he was a fighter, as I said, I'd studied him. I'd watched him before, I'd seen him against the Pavliks, the Jermaine Taylors, I'd seen him getting broken down before, but I knew early doors he was someone not to be messed with. And I knew Sky were keen on Miranda, they really wanted the fight because Barney Francis liked Edison Miranda, Eddie liked Edison Miranda. It's an explosive fight. So I thought, just be careful. And I, and I was a little bit too careful. It didn't go down well with Sky. They didn't like how, how, how careful I was because everyone loved the bomber. He just jumps on people, he fights, he knocks them out. This was the first time I started showing me boxing brain in a professional ring uh, and how I was uh, out putting people out boxing them and them slowly breaking them down. I now became a box puncher mm. uh, and they didn't like that. It, it didn't do well on me, name me, to be honest. So, the worst was yet to come, but for now, I've got past Edison Miranda and, and I'm happy, but in the background looming was that court case and if I lose it and that's all I could think about was the court case and losing to Frank. You beat uh, Belonte on the Froch Brute bill. Yeah. Um, were you sparring Froch for that fight? Because you, got, you did wind up sparring with him for a while, didn't you? I was his chief sparring partner for was, was it the last two fights for the Kessler fight I was his chief right. sparring partner and for the Andre Ward I was his chief sparring partner. I think it was them fights. Uh, what were they like? Your spars? Yeah, they paid to see them. They were good, mate. They were good. Had some great days. Uh, we we recall and some bad days. <laughs> uh, do you know what? I, I never really took hidings off Carl because I I had the size advantage. Don't get me wrong. We'd have some really hard spars, and, and he'd give just as good as he got on days. But Carl was someone who who was a who was a really tough, hard fighter, and and he 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 sparred the way he fought, which suited me down to the ground because he'd come for everything. Uh, he really would, and he'd walked onto a few a few times. But as I said, some of the days. We'd done 15 rounds straight off and not stopped many a time. Mm. And just nailed each other in the gym for fun. So I loved it. I loved it because Froch was someone who I looked up to a little bit. You know, he was of the, the former, the, the previous generation before I've, you know, he was the one who we were looking at to get to their level. 
Well, and, and, and David Hay was one of those because oh, yeah. David were 2001 world champs, weren't yeah. they? But I'd sparred with David yeah. already, so I knew quite well about it. When I just won the ABA title uh, and become ABA champion for the first time, David A needed sparring partners. He was set to fight Mark Hobson, and he sparred me and David Price, and we gave him an absolute hiding in the Solly gym. Uh, and he took an absolute chillaxing, and then the next day pulled out with an injury on his hammy. Uh, so, yeah, and I that, knew him. And that was the seed spread for you and him. Yes. When you said worst was to follow for Sky, I'm guessing you're referring to the Isaac Chalemba fight. Yeah, that was a disaster. I just didn't perform well. Uh, and as I said before, I'm not someone who makes excuses or, or likes to go on about that. But me and mother-in-law at the time was in a coma and had been in a coma for, I think it was three weeks. How relieved were you to put Chalemba to, to bed and beat him in the rematch? Very happy. Uh, it was just... I, I beat him. I beat him and no one, had, no one at that stage had beat him as clearly as I'd beat him. I just beat him up in the rematch. I just got on his chest. It was a fight. The way we prepared for it was we got sparring partners in like amateurs who were really quick and they just moved and we, we, we made them change over literally every two to three rounds. And But they ran like anything and I would just live, take everything they had, get close, put my head on the chest, boom, 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 work. It wasn't pretty, but it, it, it made good work. I'd say, Eddie... Thought it was a disaster that first fight in Liverpool, and it was because I'm top of the bill and everyone wants a good show at the end of the day. But for the rematch, it was purely about get close and outwork him, and I'd done that. And I'd say it wasn't pretty well. Eddie was quite happy with how the rematch went for viewing figures and stuff like that, but Broch was top of the bill, so it was more about him. Sure. But uh, getting rid of him and, and doing it the way I did, it was a quick turnaround as well, so my weight didn't, didn't balloon. Well, you mentioned weight and how. Tough it was for the first Chilemba fight in particular, but it was really rough by now for the Stevenson fight in Montreal. Oh, I was finished. Um, I was done there's famous pictures now of you doing the rounds online of what the, what state you're in for pre pre Stevenson. Yeah. And look at you now. Obviously, what are you walking around at now? Seventeen stone, just under. Okay, so that's five stone. Yeah, so it's a it's a big drop down there. He was a hero out there. How good was it? Was it He was Stevenson? better than me. He was stronger than me. Full stop? Yeah. I'm happy to say that. Uh, I think I was the better boxer than him, but as an all-round package, he was better than me. Uh, I had one good round where I put him over in the third round, I think it was, uh, and I disabate him on the back of the head and he goes over. He's clearly dazed when he gets up on the referee. I think he's the best referee in the world. I think Michael Griffin was the yeah. referee in that. Uh, saved my life in without doubt. But I had one round of decent have a decent go and then I was finished made the levels I went to to make weight that night I couldn't explain to you how bad it was walk into the ring did yeah. you were you confident no no so what was it my confidence was... actually went when I made weight because I knew I was dead so at what when point so when you walked to the ring what were you trying to do not lose not get knocked no, out I, or were I you trying, trying to, to win just, just cop him catch not, him you say get lucky it's not getting lucky because you throw the punch and it lands and you knock him out it's done the job it's supposed to do but I was just hoping I was going to land one I was gonna did you feel one. that it was a storybook did you think that it was there and that, that it was like going to be like that <laughs> did it? Like the how movies. would you know <laughs> <laughs> you turn up and it's minus 28 and, and, and it's freezing on the snow I literally just thought this was the Rocky movie, but I wasn't fucking Rocky. So you kind of had that confidence that it was that it was written that it was actually going to happen. Yeah. That as you ground your way down to the weight and yeah. you were going to land one shot. Just one shot. I knew I had one punch's chance and that was it. But what at what point during the fight did you realise it wasn't? Was it only when it After ended? It in that third round. That was it. Because I had nothing left. I, I had a little go. I think it was the third round. I gave it everything I had in that round. And when I came back in that round, I knew I was gone. So going out for those last couple of rounds against Stevenson, when you're physically sold out, are you emotionally and mentally sold out as well? Yeah, I'd been away from my family for two months. Uh, I hadn't seen them, which was a long time. Uh, I was living in Jersey City for a month, uh, just back and forth. And I say then went to Canada, travelled there. Just an emotional wreck, really. I think that's the closest that I've come to a full-blown breakdown, making way for Stevenson. I was in the hot bath, so I got to the to four pound. I was twelve stone eleven, and I could not get any more weight off. I couldn't do it. I'd ran for an hour on the treadmill. I remember Ed Robinson walking in, looking at me as if to say, "I shouldn't see you doing this," but I was running on the treadmill with a sweatsuit on, with a towel around my neck, and the weight weren't coming off. 
on the phone and Kerry Kay's panicking. Kerry, Kerry Kay said to me, Tony, your body shut down. The only way to get it out now is to drag it out. And I said, Kerry, what do you mean? Because at this point, I'd never gone in saunas and stuff like that uh, to make weight. I did for the Cleverly fight, but that was a last minute thing. I was, I was a late replacement. Preparing for a fight, I would always make weight, but I would do it the best way possible. And I would be light early and I would chip the last bit at the end. But for this one, it just weren't coming off, Jess. I remember being, speaking to Kerry, and Kerry Case was always my man who I'd go to uh, throughout the owner of the CMP. And he said to me, Tony, you've got to drag it out. And I said, Alan, he said, getting a hot bath full of salt. He said, and I mean hot. And I said, what do you mean? He said, hot that it hurts when you get in. And I was like, oh, for fuck's sake. And I thought, oh, come on. I think I'd done 10, 15 minutes in a hot bath and the four pound came off. I got on the scales naked. Uh, Walked down the stairs to Eddie Ayn's room. <clears throat> he, ju he just arrived that day. And he went, you look great, Tone. And I remember him hugging me. And, and, and I remember just feeling his head on me on my shoulder there. And Gary and Mick were behind me. And I'm just shaking his head. And I could feel him shake. I feel, felt his head shake like that when he was on my shoulder. And I just thought, I don't know. I went to the scales. Uh, went a bit crazy. Because he put his, Stevenson put his face in my face, so I just buttered him. At this point, I, I, I just didn't care. That's the loneliest, darkest moment of my career, without doubt. Went back to my room after the, after the fight and just cried myself to sleep. My wife had travelled all the way over there, didn't even see her. Did you think of retirement, or was it straight away, right, well, the light heavy's a couple over? Of, I knew light heavy was over. My plan was to beat it on a Stevenson, and then straight away call out Bernard Hopkins at a catchweight. That was my plan. And I knew he'd probably want some of it as well. Uh, and I always, had, I always had a plan in my mind ahead to do what I was going to do. So I just thought, I'm going to do it. I'll figure a way out. I'll get it done. But I was just in a dark place. After Should you have fight. taken the Stevenson fight? I had to. It was a mandatory challenger. I, I, well, you didn't have to. Have you, to. you do because you've, I've, you've got to remember the last three years of my career was about earning that shot. Everyone I'd faced was in it. I'd won two eliminators and two final eliminators. If I'd have not fought Stevenson, all that, them years would have been gone to waste. And I'd struggled that much against Chalemba to make weight. I thought to myself, just one more time. Just And every fighter keeps lying to themselves. I've told you fighters are the best liars. Yeah. And I lied to myself, telling myself, I'll be okay, I'll be okay. But I wasn't, mate. I was just done. I was done. My body was fucked. And that, that's just one of them things, as I say, you, you have to learn. You have to... It has to happen to you, because there'll be more fighters after me, there'll be more fighters again, so they'll do the same thing. Robert McCracken was giving me great advice many years later, saying, Tone, I just outgrew the middleweight division, and, mm -hmm. and that's why I never, and he was a brilliant fighter, Robert McCracken, but so many other fighters do it. They just outgrow the division, and, and I I shouldn't have even been light heavyweight. I didn't outgrow, I was too big for light heavyweight, but that's in hindsight, it's all right saying that. When you keep making weight and keep getting there at that last pull, that last roll of dice, you, you keep doing it. At what point did you start to come out of the, the depression, of the, of the funk uh, that you fought brood of next? Yeah, I had to bounce out quick. So what I'd done is, the next day, well, it might have been in the dressing room after it, my friend said to me, you're going to have to reinvent yourself at a new weight. He said, Aunt, you can't do this to your body. And I said, I know I will, I'll do it, I'll do it. But my friend was giving me great advice, but it's all well and good people giving you this advice and, and giving you a little bit of advice on what to do, but I'm the one who's got to do it. I'm the one. You know, everyone's great throwing the 10 pence in. Aren't you quarterbacks? Mate, everyone's great doing it, and even the people in my team were great at doing it, but I've got to do it. I've got to actually follow through on what you're telling me to do. So I'd done it, uh, and then I set about going to cruise weight. I always knew a crew, I'd be a world champion at cruise weight. That was always, I knew at some point I'd do it, but my plan was first to leapfrog all the contenders at cruise weight. My plan was to win a world title light every weight, an easier one, and then get leapfrog all the contenders and go straight in with a champion at cruise weight who I knew I could beat. And as I say, I, got, I was world champion at cruise weight, but I didn't get to leapfrog all the contenders. I now had to start going through them, and Brudov was the first one up. And it yeah. wasn't an easy task, especially when you look at him. I think he had 40, 40 plus fights. He had more knockouts than I had fights. I remember Eddie the end saying, uh, Tony, it's a hard fight, but you know, you've just fought for the world title against Donna Stevens and stuff. Basically, Eddie was edging his bets and wanted to see if I had the cruiserweight. Well, and also then he, you, 
he, he signed Cleverly, didn't he? Yeah. So then you and Cleverly had like a semi-finals yeah. to meet. You fought De Santos. I fought De Santos. And, never been stopped. And then you fought Nathan in the rematch. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's fair to say that that is not a fondly remembered fight. fight. Yeah. That's what. That's when. That was me. That was the lowest point with Sky Sports. But you did. Did you get any satisfaction? Because you were a clear yeah, winner, even up. though it was a split decision. Mate, I was made up. I didn't care. I was so happy. I was so so happy. I beat him. I, uh, everything I said in the build up to the fight, I done. I said I'm going to bully you for twelve rounds. I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to smash you. If you fight with me, I'm going to knock you out clean. He wouldn't fight with me, but not entertain me. Just lied on the ropes and covered up and threw the odd jabby in there, because in the very first round he felt me power and he knew it was a different beast he was he was getting in the ring with. So it takes two to make a great fight, sis. And I never get people never let me forget that fight. But I can't force the kid to fight. Never with anyone else in his whole career did he get in the ring and not want to have a fight. But he did with me that night. And why did he do that against me? A few fights later, he gets in with Fon Fard and has an absolute gut wrenching war. He goes in the ring with Badu Jack and stands toe to toe with him and gets dealt with. Why? Why didn't he do that? Me? Because he knew getting knocked out to me, he would never leave him. So he was happy to just survive and lose on points. I was so happy. And then I also had things going on in the background with the movie and stuff like that, which I wasn't going to do if I lost that fight. Yeah, I remember we were speaking at the time, and you you were saying that you've got offered this this movie, but you can't move forward with it until you've beaten Cleverly because you'd feel like a fraud I would. becoming a Hollywood star coming off the loss I to would. Cleverly yeah I would have so I wouldn't have done the movie I told her all of MGM Sly Kugler they all sat and watched me be Cleverly that night in America <laughs> it's crazy when you think so how did that who made that first call to you to say there's a film a guy whose friends his name was Mark and he called me up uh, he knows Ross Barkley's best mate's dad but he knows Sylvester Stallone's right hand man, Kevin King Templeton. And Kevin King Templeton got hold of him, and then he got hold of me, and it just went round and round. About what did so. they say to you? They, why did they want you? I haven't got a clue. They'd watched, they'd <laughs> they must have said, they must have had a pitch. They'd watched, no, didn't have no pitch from me. They'd watched uh, my. Ryan Coogler wanted me. He was the director of the movie. He'd found me through YouTube. Uh, he wanted a European fighter with a football background or whatever have you. And he, he likes working with people who aren't general actors. And I didn't think I could do it. So I met him and I was like, I don't think I can do this, but I really like it. We stay in touch with Cougs and stuff like that. He was at my wedding, so you know, I stay in touch with Ryan all the time. He's an amazing person. Uh, him and his wife, Cindy, and his dad's boss and his mum, his brothers, they're all great people. I just love them all. But he believed in me that I could do it. I didn't think I could do it. Is there a chance that, that you fucking rat line Got you, got you the job in Hollywood. No, when I I done a vi I done a YouTube video with Coon Cassie and went around my area of where I'm from, uh, Toxteth and Wavertree. I was born in I was born in Toxteth and raised in Wavertree, so I showed them Lawrence Road, Smithdown Road, places where I played as a kid. Uh, we walked around. Now Coogler had seen this thing on YouTube that was done by Eiffel in London, and he, he said it's him. I got offered the gig in the Malmaison Hotel. Thirteen weeks before the. 14 weeks before the Cleverly rematch, and I said no. I said no. Three, they made me three, two offers, I said no. Third offer, I thought, are these serious? They're going to pay me that much to do this thing. And then I was like, okay. I said, I don't know, I don't think I can do it. The next day, Ryan Coogler flew into Liverpool, flew into Manchester, and then got drove into Liverpool, and I stayed with Ryan Coogler. I actually know because I went and worked for Sky Sports as a co commentator on the Christopher Rebrasse George Groves fight at Wembley Arena. Ryan Coogler was in the arena that night on the Sowlands bill because I got him in and he watched me work for Sky. And he said to me, he said, Tone, I want you to play for the TV He said, I don't want no one else. And I was like, Ryan, I don't think I can do it. And uh, he said, Trust me, I know you, you're perfect for the role. And he just, all the credit goes to him for that movie, for, to Ryan Coogler. Do you enjoy it? When I was there, I loved it. We had a great time. You lived in Philly for a bit? I lived in Philadelphia for three months. Amazing place. Be Did brilliant place. Loved it. At that time, was that the highest purse you'd received, boxing related? Yeah. Okay. Mm. So good deal then. Yeah. Because you fought for the world title. Twice. Twice. Yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you deal with Stallone? Was he on the set with you? Yeah. What was that like? Great. Surreal? Yeah. It was when I first met him. I was about to call him uh, Rock. <laughs> <laughs> Come in. I got to know Coogs at this time, and, I, and as I said, I trusted Ryan Coogler because he was a street kid just like me. 
and we got on. But when I first got introduced to Sly, it was like I was he come up and, and we we shook hands. He, I watched him do a screen test, and in the screen test, he just recited poetry that was in his mind. He didn't he didn't look. He just looked at the camera and recited this poetry for a good five minutes. And I was like, I was trying to make Ed or Taylor what he was saying. And I just never had a clue. But it was, I done the screen test and then I met him after it. And Coog said, Sly, this is pretty Ricky Conlon, Tony Bellew. And I said, and I, was, well, I put my hand and I went, hello, Rock. And as I was going to call him Rock, and I, and I went, Mr. Stallone. And he, and he went, hey, don't call me Stallone, call me Sly. I'm a big fan of yours, think you're a brilliant fighter. Uh, this and that. He probably didn't know, never watched me fight, but he being nice he and whatever that be. Yeah, humoured me. And he said, anything you need, son, you let me know and I'll help you out. He said, but... Uh, I'm looking forward to doing this. I think you're perfect for the role. And I was like, wow. I just thought, wow, this is amazing. I'm sitting here. Because I was a bigger Rambo fan than I was Rocky fan as a kid. I just loved blowing things up and <laughs> shooting everything. So uh, it was good, mate. It was crazy. I got to know MBJ really well. We all lived together for three months. They yeah. lived in a, in a different night. MBJ lived in an apartment block around the corner. I lived in an hotel and Sly lived in a different hotel. But every day we'd be spending time around each other. Because I went to set even when I wasn't supposed to be on sex, I wanted to watch these actors act and work yeah, yeah. every day. So I would go all the time, just watch them work, watch them work. And then when I was ready for work, it would come naturally then. And as I said, they've always been very complimentary of me acting. They was like, you should. I remember Sly saying to me, move to LA. You don't need to be getting punched in the face no more. Just leave it alone. I was like, nah, I've got to become world champion. Did you actually knock anyone out? Do you like to say I did? MBJ's a great actor. He got a slap. Like a working punch. <laughs> Heavy-handed slap. Did he go down? Yep. <laughs> um, Goodison Park, Merseyside, I mean, it was all a little bit mental, wasn't it? Yeah, that yeah. was me dream. Me dream. And, and because of the movie, the way it happened, everyone thought the actual fight happened at Goodison Park, but it never did. It was superimposed on us from a screen, from, a, from Philadelphia in a green screen room to all the way to Goodison Park. So when I actually the fight finally did happen there, that's only the second fight I've ever been nervous for in my whole life. First one was that first ever amateur fight. Yeah. And the second one was Goodison Park. I mean, I'm skimming over that Masternak fight, which, which was, for you, it was a speculate to accumulate fight. It was you backing yourself to put yourself in a position to fight for a while. Eddie threw me to the lines, basically. Sink or swim? Yeah, he threw me to the lines. And, and I can't blame him when I look back. At the time, I called him every twat under the sun. And we had a big argument over the money that I was getting. And he said, Tone, I'm not paying the bills, which I later learned he was telling the truth, but you know, he said, it's AJ's card, it's AJ's money, this is the most I can pay you. This, the fight's got a budget and this is it. And I was like, fuck off, this is wrong. You are putting me for a European Cruiserweight title against a former European champion and you're paying me fucking shit money. But fair play, you backed yourself and you did it. And you know what the mad part is? I did back myself because before the Mastag fight, I got asked to fight, but the fight, an unknown heavyweight on Dave, on David Hayes' fight with Christopher Damori, or whatever his name oh, is. Mark, Mark Damori, yeah. Mark Damori. Well, I fight an unknown heavyweight for double the amount Eddie was paying me to fight Masternach. And I said, no, I've gave Eddie my word. I've shook hands with him and said, I'll do it. And, he, and David phoned me, and David said, are you mad? Why are you going to fight Masternach? The guy's only ever been stopped on his feet. He's a former European champion. Have you seen his record? And I was like, I said to Eddie, I'll do it. He said, have you signed the contract? I said, no. He said, well, what are you doing it for? So then I didn't do it. Uh, I fought Masternach. I knew I'd beat him, but I knew it'd be a hard fight because I knew he'd be there till the end. I come so close to getting rid of him in the 12th round. This is where I always said, at cruiserweight, I get stronger as the fights go on. So when Dave, I pissed the first six rounds against Masternach, I'm playing with him, I'm schooling him, I'm beating him up, bullying him, hating him with certain shots. From round seven to nine, I've switched off. And I've led him back into this fight. I've given him a way back in. And he wins 10. I remember Dave saying, why are you doing this? Why are you letting it get close? And I was like, I've got it under control, got it under control. 11th round, I've come out and I've done all right. But the 12th round, Dave's given me a bollock and at the end of 11, he said to me, you've got to win this round big just to make sure it's nailed on. I went out and I nearly stopped him. I hit him with a left hook on his leg, go to jelly and he's kept an hold of me. He tries to chip me up and take me down. Uh, really good, hard fight, but... As I said, I was furious at Eddie for putting me in that fight. But the, I remember his words to me where when we'd finally agreed it and I was pissed off with the money he made, he got me a sponsorship bet for a little bit extra money to put on top. And he said to me, 
Tone, it's quite simple. If you can't beat Matthias Masternich, you can't become world champion. And, and I was I was like, you cheeky bastard. So when I fought Masternich that night, Eddie Hearn was as much my opponent as Masternich was. Um, and then obviously came Goodison Park. How was your feeling going into the fight at Goodison Park as opposed to what it was like in Montreal? Nerves. Unbelievable. More I had, nervous I, I had, I had, Yeah, I had no nerves in Montreal. I was just, I knew I was done. In, in Goodison, I knew this was my last throw of the dice. I knew everything was on this. And I also had the massive pressure. You've got to remember, I've spent nearly every other Saturday at Goodison Park since I was what age, going the match. I had season tickets. When me boxing went to another level, I obviously didn't get to go to the game hardly ever because I was boxing for England. I was always doing things on weekends with boxing. You got to that level with GB. It was always occupied over the weekends. But it still didn't stop me being a massive, mad Everton fan. So anyway, if I had lost... To Macau because I'd have never have gone and go to some park again for the shame. I've been relaying this dream since them days in Rotunda ABC when I'm telling people I'm going to fight to go to some holiday. I've now it's now here. It's happening. So despite the despite the nerves, did you have the belief? I knew I could beat him, but I knew if it went past six rounds, he was going to get me because he's someone who just gets stronger and stronger and his work rate goes up through the roof. He's someone who you'd have to clock it, clock early and get rid of him. You've got to wipe him out. But you got clocked early. Yeah, I got my nose broken, got flat on my back once again. Great. Uh, I was winning the first round, it was all going so well. I stuck to the game plan. I knew I had to start quick. Dave didn't like the thought of me starting quick in this fight because he thinks I'm giving him an opportunity to nail me, and he was half right. But I'd studied Maccabi that much and understood his game. I knew I had to get rid of him in them first six. I had to, because if I didn't, he just keeps coming and coming and coming, and his actual durability levels get better as the fight goes on. Because he's so fit. So, I'm um, started the round well. I'm jabbing him. I hit him with a lovely left hook to the body. And I hear the, the, old, the grunt you want to hit. And then he tries to hide it. And they've got him. I'm nailing him on the ropes in the first round. But then once again, I've pulled out. Admired me work and put my stupid big chin up in the air like an ostrich. <laughs> Boom. He hits me right on the button. But he hits me. The impact is on my nose. But then he hits me that hard, it snaps my nose and pushes down to my chin. And it pushes my chin and jaw down, back, look like that. And once again, I just, my legs collapse underneath me and I fall backwards and roll over. Uh, I jump up immediately. I've done this throughout my career. I just jump up really quick. I'm not someone who takes the knee and as I think about it, I just jump up and I start talking to myself. Mm. Uh, I start talking to myself and the referee called me a lunatic. He said, you're nuts. Yeah, and I said, just let, I'm going to kill him. Just let me in I'm going to nail him. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you, I don't remember anything about the second round. I don't. I remember being at the end of the first, Caldwell being right this close to my face. You got greedy, you got greedy. And I was like, for fucking hell, I know I'm greedy. It's the last thing I need telling at this point in my life. <laughs> and at the end of the first round, just being dropped. Uh, but then I'd be lying if I said to you, I didn't remember anything. I actually thought after the fight, I knocked him out in the second round. I don't remember anything of the second round. I don't remember anything he said to me at the end of the second. All I remember is getting into an exchange with him on them ropes and in the back of my mind got to get rid of him before six got to get rid of him before six get him to shoot the to shoot a lazy jab that's all i ever wanted McCoy to do I, I planned on getting him to shoot the lazy jabs just shoot a lazy right hand so i can get you clean with the left hook because no one everyone knocks southpaws out with right hands no one ever really it's very rare you get to knock a southpaw clean out with a left hook but I knew he, would, he he fought like a lazy fighter at times in the fight. So he, he would ponder with his right hand, just th give you a throwaway shot. And as he thrown it, boom, Vic worked. What me and David worked on all camp was tone. The minute it comes across, all the weight on the left leg come right back across. And I felt it. I felt the lazy shot come across. And as it touched me there, I just put everything in. Just boom, and I hit him. And I could have made, I could have counted to 100 and he was out. You knew that was it? I knew, even though I did punch him two more times on his way down, I knew that was it, you just got to make sure. But I could have just stood there the minute that landed and just watched him fall, but I didn't. I always go for the absolute kill. But Was that the best out. moment of your career? Yeah, without doubt. The best moment of me whole... Entire, Despite what followed? Yeah. yeah okay. Me, best moment of me whole life, me professional life in that moment. The best thing ever is me kids being born. I'm, I'm me spending time with me missus now, because without them, I would not have chose this. I would not be a boxer without them. Because there were so many much easier ways to earn money and earn more money than I've got if I'd have stuck at that point. Yeah, yeah, there were so much more easier ways to make money. But that thought of staying out of jail and staying off the bad off, off the bad path 
they're the ones who stay, made me stay on because there was no way I was having my kids visit me in Nick. So, as I said, when that happened and that punch landed, all my dreams came true. Uh, my whole life was about boxing at Goodison Park, becoming WBC world champion. I always, I, I always wanted that specific belt. Yeah. And when that punch landed, my dreams came true, mate. I just, it the greatest thing that, that ever happened in my professional life and career. The next thing you know, you're getting slapped by David Hay at a press conference. <laughs> Punched. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, we makes a quick uh, defence against BJ Flores, to which I didn't want to do, but it did to to, the, to make Eddie Hearn happy. And, and you got some headlines for the Hay fight. Yeah. Was it, So people will ask, how much of this grudge with David was legit? And how All much of it was, was legit. All of it was legit because I wanted to fight him. And I admit, this, this had been going on since the Masternak fight in the background. This had been going on social media. We were back and forth at each other's throats. David A turned up at the Creed premiere with BJ Flores. Uh, and we had a picture together. I've got the picture on my phone. The picture of me and me, my eldest son. And uh, I said, I remember getting the picture and David comes over and he stands by me. And, and I said to me, oh, Corey. So I said, Corey, is the one who wants to uh, knock your dad out. And he just went, yeah, I would. I'd knock you clean out. I'd knock, I'd knock you dad clean out. And he said to me, son, and I thought, it's not the time or the place. Usually, means I would just have that straight away with a punch in his face. But I just thought, I'm at the career premier, I just can't go out like that. So I just give it a smile, didn't say anything to him, just led my son away. It always stuck with me what he said to me, lad. That's just David's way. You know, it's probably changed now over the years, but that was his way then. He's still an active fighter. I knew, even the first day I sparred David Day in that Salisbury gym, I knew one day I'm going to face him. I told David Price that day. When we finished sparring, he paid us £100 each. He should have paid me more because I dropped him. But uh, I told him that day, I said to David, I'm going to fight him one day. And David Price was like, how can you, he's still an amateur, you've just won maybe. I said, Price, I'm going to fight him one day, trust me. And when it finally came about, Price, he was training with me in Coldwell's gym. And he said, you said all these years it would happen. I said, I told you. I just knew. I don't know how I knew. I'm not fucking, I'm not a, you know, whatever it's so called. So did you dislike David? It's not that I disliked him. I knew I could beat him. What, see, David made the mistake of, as I said before, that offer came after I'd won the world title. i just defended against BJ Flores. The phone rang. Someone offered me £1.6 million to fight David A yeah. on BT Box Office. It was going to be the platform launch for BT Box Office. I didn't have a contract with Eddie Hearn. Now, someone's offered me £1.6 million. It was more than my whole career had amounted to at this stage. Mm. My whole career. And Eddie said to me, Tony, you've got to take it. I can't offer you money like that. I said, I'm not going to take it because I gave you my word that we're going to stick together and we're going to do it. And it's my tone. It's £1.6 million. And I was like, I know what it is, but now that I know he wants to fight me, trust me, we'll get this sorted and you're going to make the fight. David A wanted me to fight him and said, I'm not working with Eddie Ian because he didn't like Eddie. Him and Eddie clashed. Well, they went on in that first presser, didn't they? Because David went he, for he it. He hated Eddie. Yeah, he which fucking was, hated He Eddie. made it more about him and Eddie yeah, him and Eddie did about him and you. Because he looked past me that much. Mm. See, now, the reason why David punched me at that first press conference and no one ever understands this and he won't, he, he won't, he won't admit it or it, but... When we got close to each other's face for the first time, and David always thought I took the fight against him for money. I'm not going to lie, money was a massive factor, but I knew 100% in my heart I could beat him. And you know when you get this close to someone, Tris, the eyes don't lie. And I got close to him and said, I'm going to smash your fucking face in. You have no idea. And he didn't even respond any words back. He just went, yeah, yeah. He went, yeah, yeah, and then punched me. And unbelievably, I just knew. I knew his style, his style 10 times out of 10 will lose to mine. Someone who can make him miss and someone who can counter punch him. It just, it's a disaster for him. I mean, the first fight was wildly exciting. Yeah, it was nuts, but as I say, I get so much stick for it. Oh, you, you, you only beat him because he had one leg, but everyone forgets the first five rounds when he's explosive and perfectly fine. Everyone says I beat an old man, David Day. It's funny, isn't it? Because no one said he was old after them first two fights. He just fucking blasted people out the water. Mark Demori and Giraj, the other fella. No one said anything. Everyone said, David Day's flying. He looks unbelievable. He looks... He made, He looked like the... Well, more to the point, they thought that you going up against a big punch in heavyweight, you were going to get hurt. Of course, everyone thought it. And also, you'd said it. You said it as well, didn't you? You said that, the, that it was a gamble, like... Well, you were putting yourself in harm's way. He's the only person in the world who I've ever fought who, could, who I knew could generally permanently damage me. That's why I've done a will before the first fight.
And then obviously the second fight was a bit of a demolition job. Yeah, I'd done a proper job on that. But I'd gone through so much in, in between two fights. I'd lost my brother-in-law, which was the most horrific thing that's ever happened in our lives. And I don't mean that from me personally. It was what I what it done to my wife. What it done to my wife and my family was just what the sisters and his brothers went to, the, her mother and her father. You've got to remember, I've been with her for 18, 19 years, 20 years this year. Uh, they're my family. And when we lost them, it, it just it, it was just the worst thing ever. So you're talking about Ashley, yeah. who I can sense, even through your text messages, you've never been the same mm. since. I yeah, I mean, as I say, I don't want to... That's me sister's... That's me my wife's brother, but... You're such a close family, we all absorbed it. As I said, it's their brother, so I don't want to make it as if it's about me, because it's yeah, not. Sure. But it's just that I've seen what it's done to my wife, and it's the most heartbreaking thing ever, and it still sticks with us now. You know, every day, not a day that goes by, we don't think about him. You, whether you individually or as a family, have carried darkness ever since, haven't you? Oh, yeah, I mean, it stays with you forever. I say, oh, you have to look at my wife and know what she's thinking and it just kills me every day. But there's nothing I can do, mate. We just have to move on with our lives and keep going as best as we can. Uh, there's well, just so much shit. You, when you can't get over something because there's stuff that surrounds it and we don't know the truth. We, we think we know the truth. Quite confident I know the truth, but we, we never had it confirmed because, you know, the Mexican judgments and law is just so unruly. It's unbelievable. I just want to be there for me missus and, and, and try and help her because she's the one who's really suffered. You know, really, she has mate, and it's so sad. And her sisters suffered, and his mother and father have suffered so much, and her, and his brothers have suffered. And I'm sure his kids suffer every day. But you know, and the the people who are suffering, what would be more easier for them is they know the truth. Mm. They know the truth, and we don't. And, and that's the hardest part about it all. Um, the se so then you had the second hay fight, and we're coming into a a, um, a period that's going to be very familiar to. Um, listeners, where obviously you get married, you're out on your honeymoon, yeah. and you, you sit cool, you're out from winning the Super Series. Crazy, I'm the first name on his mouth, and he's just unified the belts for the first time in the, in the division's history. He's got all four belts in the ring magazine belt, and the first name he shouts is some fat scouser. <laughs> and you, you thought you were retired. But yeah. you left the door open because you, you, you'd see, you must have wanted him to call you out it, somewhere. I, d I didn't actually want him to call me out because I just, <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just didn't like the thought of fighting him. I'd sparred with him in Ukraine many years before. I didn't. Uh, I had so much respect for him. He's, a, he's an amazing fighter, the best I ever fought, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, so a part of me wants to test yourself against the best, and a part of me thinks... Once again, the fighter in me, the liar in me, tells myself I can definitely beat him. I know I can this and that. So, yes, a part of me wants to fight him. Yes, I definitely want to fight for all them belts. I'm a boxing historian. I love it. And I know everything there is to know about it. And I know this, you know, if I can do this, I'd be the first fighter in this country's history to ever unify belts all at once with a ring magazine belt as well. You know, the first one to properly, properly do it in a division, you know, in the current era. So... Yeah, that wanted to be, but a part of me thought, when he made contact, and after he'd shouted my name, I was on my honeymoon, as everyone knows, uh, my first thought was, can we get it done at Cruiserweight, because I've been retired now for X amount of time. Well, all about these sanctioning, Eddie said 100% he'll sanction it, because he knows there's such big money in it. And also, you left the door open, being Cruiserweight, WBC Cruiserweight champion, I'm Emirates' champion, and I'll always be Emirates' champion with the WBC, so I can actually call upon that even today, <laughs> which I'm not going to do, but I <laughs> uh, So, yeah, the, the thoughts went through my mind, but ultimately, we get to the stage of everything's agreed within 24 hours. He agrees to the, all my demands, but I shouldn't say that's a silly word to say. He agrees to everything I put in front of him, because sure. he straight away knows that I'm a big draw. Yeah. And he knows where the money is. You know, I'm going to pay him more than double he's ever been paid in his whole life uh, to fight me just once. Was that your highest payday, you sick, or was it second value? Sorry, uh, second pay fight. I'm not sure. You know, they were pretty close to it because right. I had all control of everything. With the Hay one, there's a split. The majority of the split went to me with the with the Hay rematch, but with the Usyk one, I had everything. I paid him a fee, right? And that's how it works. But yeah, I say that the business side of it, it's massive. 
but they were two huge paydays. And as I say, when you get to start getting to double digit millions, then it's, it's insane. Because you'd flirted with fighting WBO heavyweight champ Joseph Parker, didn't you, as well? I fancied that. That's the one I wanted. I definitely think I could have beaten. I'd have had to have been good for 12 rounds, but I, I, I felt the way I felt after beating Hay in the rematch, that's the best performance I've ever performed. I'm not saying it's the best result of me because it's nothing touch as good as some park. But the way I performed in that Hay rematch, and everyone wrote, God remember this, David Hay knew what he was going in with the second fight. In amazing shape what he was, everyone knew. He, did, he didn't underestimate me this time. He knew how hard I punched, he knew he had to beat me, he knew his career was on the line, he was in great shape, but so was I because I had all the doubts against me saying I could only beat him because he had one leg. So when I went into that rematch, I switched off from Ashley for five minutes and, and gave everything, me, me complete focus in that rematch when I'd done it with Hay in the rematch. And that's the best, I, I think that's the best performance in my career. For you, Sick, it just got the feeling watching it that you had to box out of your skin to contain him. Without doubt. Uh, I was boxing really well. He do, I'd done something that he never anticipated. All fights, I kept saying, all I've got to do is knock you out. I can only knock you out, I can only knock you out. And he bought into it himself. So he kept chasing me and chasing me and chasing me and he couldn't see the traps I'd set. And the traps I'd set him was, he's not the best going forward. He's fantastic on the back foot. He'd give you angles, he'd give you space. He'd, he'll dictate and dominate on the back foot when you think you're in control. He's dictating the space. When he pushed to come forward, he's lost because he spent a whole amateur career against guys who just chase him all around the ring. And in the professionals, no one ever chases him in the ring. So it, it's weird. What he does is he takes centre stage and he dictates behind a lead, a, a lead foot that manipulates everything that happens. But against me, I just moved away. I just made him chase gradually, but I'd done it with short steps and I counterpunched him every single time. Uh, and it was working great for six rounds, but then I just got tired. <laughs> you know, if, if it was a six round fight, I'd be undisputed cruiserweight champion of the world now. But the fact is, mate, it wasn't a six round fight. It was a 12 round fight and I just was absolutely exhausted after seven rounds. Once again, I don't remember anything after round seven. That interview, there was some criticism that um, you shouldn't have been interviewed in the ring after that. I've never seen it. I've watched the fight back, but I've never seen the interview after it. So I haven't a clue what got said, what done, but I'm told I was speaking a load of mumbo jumbo. It was basically, I think you were, there was a lot of repetition. So you were going, you were saying the same thing. Over was over. I? Sign a concussion, obviously. Yeah. Oh, mate, I was heavily concussed. Like, I don't remember anything after, the last thing I remember saying was to Dave was, I'm completely exhausted. And then the next thing I remember is being back in the dressing room and seeing my wife. Do you worry about the amount of abuse you've taken in boxing? Of course, of course, because I don't remember certain things. I still can't remember them to this day, but that's boxing, mate. I knew what I signed up for, and no other boxer can claim anything else. So these fighters who have got lawsuits going against promoters and managers, I think you're fucking scumbags. Why are you trying to sue boxing? It's no one else's fault but your own. It does me nothing, it does me titter when I see these fighters suing people. Why is it, it's no one else's fault? No one made your box, lad. No one made your fight. You chose to fight. So if I if I go into any kind of state as I get older, it's not Eddie Earn's fault, it's not Frank Warren's fault, it's mine. I chose to fight. I knew what I was getting into. I agreed the money before the fight, you pay me, that's it, end of. Do you think people do understand about long term damage, CTE, punch uh, syndrome? Yeah, I've watched I've I've watched the concussion movie where Will Smith plays yeah. a great part. Alem Alembe is his name. Yeah. Uh, an amazing film. I've studied various things in it and I've really read up and, and done me, me research on them, so I do know a bit about it. It, it is worrying. It is going to show later on in my life, as, as I 100% know. But there's things that are going to show up in my life just no matter what. Like, I've, I've broke my hands six times, fractured them or broke them six times. I'm probably not going to be able to hold a cup of tea by the time I'm 50. Uh, you know, arthritis will set in. I've had operations on my hands. I've took a lot of bangs on the head. You know, I'd like to think I've got everything intact. That's what everyone says to me. Oh, you've done really well. You know, you've got X amount in the bank. You've got out with all your health intact. You know, you look pretty good. People say to me, you don't look like a touch boxer. Go. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> definitely touching up for me, mate. <laughs> but, you know, people say to me, you don't look like a boxer. Your nose is not bent and straight. Right, well, no. it is bent if you touch it and feel it. But uh, I'm still, you know, mentally all right, I think. But, you know, I've got a wicked temper, which I'll always have. Uh, I've got a nasty side, which I'll always have. But nothing's really changed from what I can take in here. I've never been able to focus on anything in my whole life besides boxing. And that, that being punched in the head not changed that. I still can't focus on fuck all. I'm trying my best with golf at the minute, but I, I'm <laughs> failing miserably. I don't know, it's just, it is what it is, mate. It's boxing. And I, and I understood what I was getting into when I, when I went into it. So I don't blame anyone. I'm very grateful for what boxing's given me. Without boxing, 
without going what, through what I've gone through, I'd be in jail. There's no two ways about it, because I wanted the nice things in life and I was going to get them, regardless of whatever I had to do, I was going to get them. I'm just very fortunate that boxing gave me the way to do that, because when you're expelled from school and you've got nothing to show for your school and your whole life, then what are you supposed to do? And you and you, you, you'd have, you want the nicer things in life, and especially when you're bringing kids into the world and you don't want them to struggle and, struggle and suffer, I was going to get it, mate, either way. Wanted to touch upon SAS. Um, how close were you to Lampin and Middleton in that? I, 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 once again, I was out to prove everyone wrong. My whole career, that's all I've done when boxing. I've been out to prove people wrong. When I went into the SAS thing, I was just out to prove people wrong. Because everyone thought, automatically assumed Bell, you hard case boxer, got a bit of a mouth on him, he's definitely going to attack someone. That's what everyone had me nailed on for. I even think some of the DS had me nailed on to attack one of them at some point. Uh, well, I didn't, and I proved everyone wrong. I took the abuse, I took them shouting in my face, I took them giving me stick, whatever have you, and I just carried on and nailed on. So I really like Ham Middleton. I mean, I love him. The fella's an absolute damn. He's a Did great you know person. lamp him? Were you thinking about it? Yeah, definitely thought about it twice. Twice. When he made Nicky carry me over, put me on her back, that pissed me right off. That was wrong. But I understand, when I look back, I understand why he done it. What he said to me, I'm doing everything for a reason. And he literally does everything. There's a reason behind everything he does. He doesn't just do it to piss me off. There's a reason for it. So he tried to break me down physically, uh, which never could never be done. And physically, I'll never break. It's not going to happen. Mentally, definitely fucking finish me off. Made me reevaluate things when I came out. I'm not going to say change my life, because that's a bit step too far, but it made me reevaluate things in my life. Was it tough doing it? Horrible. Mentally, the most one of the toughest things I've ever done mentally. Physically, sound. Wasn't that bad physically, but mentally, one of the toughest things I've ever done. Purely because I didn't anticipate my personal life coming into the frame. I didn't I didn't think he'd get to that. I, I just, I, refu- I, I, I kind of block it out. Yeah. So I hide away from it. So me shitty things that are going on in my life, I just, I, I move away from it. So you know when you have people in your life and, you, and they're talking about you or, or slagging you off, I just blank it out my life. I don't even give it, I don't give it time. So if I come across someone who I don't like, I just blank them. Yeah. Or if I come across someone who's been slating me or, or saying shit about me, I don't give, the, I don't waste my energy on, on saying something to you, you prick or having a fight, chinning someone. What's the point? Yeah. If you don't like it, they're going to slag you. So, okay, Sam, you know what? Just blank them out of your life. I've done that with everything in my life. So that's all I do. How, was it the process that got you to talk about that stuff? Because there was stuff in there that we haven't spoken about, whether yeah. you, your dad when you were young, yeah. going inside, or Ashley. I but that, cause that stuff, it got out of you. Was it because it put you in that environment where it was emotional? I don't know. I would never know. Because I've never watched it back, so I don't know what, what everything... What, I know what's triggered it? Yeah, what I don't know what's triggered it. I don't know what's come out. Uh, when it comes to me dad and, me, and seeing me dad in prison, that's just life for a lot of kids and for the area that I've grown up in. So but that must be things. part of your thing, where you think about yeah, where you don't want to go. Yeah, of course, to me. And that mind. must have been, I'm, I'm guessing as well, with you saying that you don't want that, yeah. that, that was a harrowing experience for you. Well, it, only when you look back on it. When it's happening at the time, you're just like a kid, what the fuck is going on? But it, it sinks, it, you know, it sits in your mind, especially when you're doing fucking crazy things that can put you there as well and you think to yourself don't need to, I shouldn't be doing this because you know I can be putting my kids in the position I've been put in but as I said before that I don't blame me that for the things he's done I'd have done worse if someone ripped me off for thousands upon thousands of pounds and drove off with my money believe you me mate I'm gonna go and get that fucking money and that's all my dad done who wins a cruiser Bellew or a cruiser Herbie Hyde <laughs> uh, I was a much better boxer than Herbie, but I think I'm happy to say Herbie was a bigger one punch hitter than me, so I don't know, mate. Uh, he hopefully, he tires and I get rid of him in about six or seven rounds, but it will be very, very similar to how I approached that first Hay fight. I think David is a much better fight than Herbie High, but Herbie I could wallop me to fuck me. Who are your top three cruisers of all time? Holyfield, Usyk, and Hay. Um, what was your biggest weakness as a fighter? Emotion. Biggest strength? Heart. Um, how do you deal with no longer being a boxer? I don't. <laughs> just day to day, just try my best. What's the best advice you could give someone in the same position if you're struggling? Live it. Oh, if they're struggling with it. Yeah, like now, uh, post boxing. <sighs> Find something to focus on. Find something to focus on that you can improve on day to day. Just. If you don't find something to focus on, you'll just dwindle and think about fighting again. 
is golf your thing? Is that actually? I'm trying, I love playing golf, but I'm shit. But I love just getting out and playing. So it's helping me at the minute. Just focus on something. It really is. I, and also me, me latest little addition. So Carson, I'm loving spending. It's the first child out of all four of me kids. He is the first one I've been able to spend every minute with. I've got some good questions here from, from the guys on Patreon. Uh, Liam Tyra says, being an Everton fan myself, can you ask Tony how he felt the first time he went to Finch Farm to train and also do you regret staying at Light Heavy for so long? No, I don't regret staying at Light Heavy for so long. It was probably the making of my career. And how did I feel when I first went to Finch Farm? I was in awe. I was amazed. He was superstars and heroes to me. And I soon realised it was Tim Cale who I sat down with first and he said to me, Tony, he said, we're made up to have you here. You're a star as well. And I was like, no, I'm not. And he'd been to watch me fight in my fourth pro fight. Brilliant. Nathan Churchill, uh, what did you learn about yourself and take away from SAS Who Dares Wins? To be in better control of my emotions. And who, who surprised you in there? Leon Locksmith. Amazing. Your mates now, aren't you? Yeah, we're mates. Golf mates. <laughs> Ooh, golf buddy. <laughs> no, we speak all the time. I love Lockie. Uh, Lockie's a, a diamond. He's a good person. Comes from a very similar background to me. Uh, he, he's come through different things in his life. Uh, and he's shown he's able to deal with things. There's pressure and stuff like that. And mental anxiety and stuff like that. You know, he's brilliant. An absolute diamond. He's someone who will remain in my life for the rest of my days, I think. Uh, Mark asks, another Ever Evertonian. Uh, was he ever advised against wearing his colours on his sleeve so much for fear of alienating that shower? Yes. Um, also, yes, he, he says, and how do you feel when you hear the sirens before matches now? Honoured. They asked me if I could reuse it, and I said, don't be fucking daft, it's Everton, you can do whatever you want. I was told and warned numerous times, stop being so pro Everton, stop being so pro Everton, you know, you're going to alienate half of your city. And I was like, listen, it is what it is, it's football. If you, wanna, if, you, if you can't look past the fact that I'm an Everton fan, then you're just a knob. I support Liverpool fans yeah. in anything they do. Uh, football is football, and I'm football mad. But if a scouse is having a fight, I don't care if he supports Liverpool or Everton, I'm backing him. Who's your best friend who's ever worn a red jersey for and played for them? <laughs> Neil Dance, my best mate. And who are you tipping for you, Sitchazora? I am tipping Del Boy. You can't pick against your own, can you? No, <laughs> should never. No do matter it. how objective, no. you can't. You don't. You can't get it, can you? No, can't do it. I don't. I just don't agree with it at all. I don't agree where it goes. Even if people call you a shill for Sky or whatever, you pick your. I you pick your people. Can't don't go you? against me, people, mate. Don't go against your people ever. And even when they're in close fights, I'm giving it to me people. I've said over the years, I've watched people go against their own and go against me, my own people. My own people, and I've watched people go against me, and it just dis it just dis discourages me and disheartens me. Don't get me wrong, some will say I'm biased or I'm not fit to do the role. Okay, sound, but I don't go against me own. I don't go against me own. Um, Alan Begg asks, does Tony ever think he'll find some inner peace from his demons? I think we've all got demons. Inner peace? What's inner peace? Happiness? I don't know. I, don't, I think happiness is Elysium. I think inner peace is contentment. That's the way I see it. And I think you need to know what you want in life to find contentment. I just want to be happy, mate. I want my kids to be happy. I don't really ask for anything else no more. I, I, I've achieved everything, Tris, I've set out to do in life. Everything I set well, out to do. You can't say at 37, you've got to have new goals now. You can't, that's the dangerous thing for fighters, thinking it's all up. I you've got a long life ahead of you. Yeah, they say that, but I, I don't know, have I? Uh, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm happy day to day, I just try and live and, and be happy. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, what else, you know. I've built up things that if I go tomorrow, the, the, the kids are sound and she's You've got a property portfolio, so you've got business interests as well, so it's yes. not like you're just freewheeling. No, I'm not freewheeling, I'm, I'm busy. I'm busy yeah. day to day, I'm busy, mate. I've got headaches and fucking arseholes I have to deal with, but... <laughs> arseholes to podcast <laughs> with. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, to <laughs> uh, But I've, I've got these people, I, I like being around, I still do my work with Sky, which I enjoy doing. Uh, I'm not full time with Sky, so you know, and I'm not trying to angle a position because I don't want to be. Uh, but I, I love working with Sky, I love talking about boxing. It's the only thing I really know. I can break fighters down and I understand them. I know what they're thinking, I know what they're doing. You don't like the words celebrity and fame, do you? I hate them, they're fucking nonsense, they don't exist. They're but they do when you go out and people recognise you. It's shit, isn't it? It's crap. I wish I could have fought with a mask on. 
But you're also, but you're also honoured though as well. Oh, yeah, there are I'm some like, people yeah. like you know when you, you, you you're yeah, you're honoured. When I'm honoured when someone would ask for a photo with me. I can't believe why would anyone ask for a photo with me? All I've done is be really determined, never gave in, and pushed and pushed and pushed. I've done nothing else that you can't do. I've done nothing else that Ross can't do. You, everyone can achieve what they want in life if you're willing to go as far as I was willing to go. If you're willing to back, never back down, never stop, just keep going and keep going, persevere, you will get there in the end. I am a perfect example of that. Well, on that note, mate, thank you so much for your time. Absolute um, pleasure. You know how I always sign off these interviews, mate. I'll leave you to get home safe to your kids. <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> At some point, it had to be added in. I have got home perfectly safe <laughs> 47 <laughs> times as an amateur. And how many in the pros did I finish on? 35, 34? I don't know what it was, but I've got home finally safe. The most dangerous thing to stop me getting home is them bastard golf clubs now. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to go with the driving range. Uh, my son's got training. I've got to do the school running a little bit. So I'm happy, mate. I can't complain. Life's good. And thank you very much for having me. I think your stories are fantastic. I think it's a great way for you to give back to boxing because you've already given an awful lot. People don't realise how many years you give to boxing, which has been brilliant through being boxing news editor and whatever have you. All the years you spent trying to get up there but then doing things like what you've done with Crawford Ashley, it gets people, like, people don't even know who he is. Some people these days, a lot of fighters, will be, well, I remember them. Uh, and just giving these guys a shout and giving these guys, you know, it lets them feel important again. It lets them feel good about themselves. And there's so many boxers out there who have got the, the heartbreaking stories being ripped off, being done. It's 90% of the fighters, just as you know. You know, less, I think it's 0.7% of boxers leave the game financially secure. I am very fortunate I'm one of them 0.7%. But we, I mean, you both know you've been around them 99.3% others and you've seen the rest of them, mate. Yeah. yeah. And it's very, very sad. So I should not complain. I am very fortunate. I am very happy. It's going all right. And thank you for coming to see us. Good to see you, mate. And thank you very much for your friendship. Hopefully it endures another 15, 20 years. Fingers crossed, I'll last that long. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Thank Tony. Thank you very much, Cheers, mate. mate.